Into the Wild, Chapter 6, Anza Borrego. No man ever followed his genius till it misled him. Though the results were bodily weakness, yet perhaps no one can say that the consequences were to be regretted, for these were a life in conformity to higher principles. If the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy and life amidst a fragrance like flowers and sweet-scented herbs is more elastic, more starry, more mortal, that is your success. All nature is your congratulation, and you have cause momentarily to bless yourself. The greatest gains and values are farthest from being appreciated. We easily come to doubt if they do exist. We soon forget them. They are the highest reality. The true harvest of my daily life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It is a little stardust caught a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. Henry David Thoreau, Walden, Our Life in the Woods, passage highlighted in one of the books found with Chris McCandless's remains. On January 4th, 1993, this writer received an unusual letter penned in a shaky anachronistic script that suggested an elderly author. To whom it may concern, the letter began, I would like to get a copy of the magazine that carried the story of the young man, Alex McCandless dying in Alaska. I would like to write the one that investigated the incident. I drove him from Salton Silly, California in March 1992 to Grand Junction Co. I left Alex there to hitchhike to South Dakota. He said he would keep in touch. The last I heard from him was a letter the first week of April 1992. On our trip, we took pictures, me with my camcorder, and Alex with his camera. If you have a copy of that magazine, please send me the cost of the magazine. I understand he was hurt. If so, I would like to know how he was injured, for he always carried enough rice in his backpack, and he always had Arctic clothes and plenty of money. Sincerely, Ronald A. Franz. Please do not make these facts available to anybody till I know more about his death, for he was not just a common wayfarer. Please believe me. The magazine that Franz requested was the January 1993 issue of Outside, which featured a cover story about the death of Chris McCandless. His letter had been addressed to the offices of Outside in Chicago. Because I had written the McCandless piece, it was forwarded to me. McCandless made an indelible impression on a number of people during the course of his Hegira, most of whom spent only a few days in his company a week or two at most. Nobody, however, was affected more powerfully by his or her brief contact with the boy than Ronald France, who was an 80-year-old when their paths intersected in January 1992. After McCandless bid farewell to Jan Burris at the Salton City Post Office, he hiked into the desert and set up camp in a break and creost at the edge of Anza Borrego Desert State State park. Hard to the east of the Salton City, a placid ocean in miniature, its surface more than 200 feet below sea level created in 1905 by a monumental engineering snafu not long after a canal was dug from the Colorado River to irrigate rich farmland in the Imperial Valley. The river breached its banks during a series of major floods, carved a new channel, it began to gush unabated into the Imperial Valley Canal. For more than two years, the canal inadvertently diverted virtually all of the river's prodigious flow into the Salton Sink. Water surged across the once dry floor of the sink, inundating farms and settlements, eventually drowning 400 square miles of desert and giving birth to a landlocked ocean. Only 50 miles from the limousines and executive tennis clubs and lush green fairways of Palm Springs, the west shore of the Salton City had once been the site of intense real estate speculation. Lavish resorts were planted, grand sub subdivisions plated, but little of the promised development ever came to pass. These days, most of the lots remained vacant and are gradually being reclaimed by the desert. Tumbleweeds scuttled down the Salton City's broad, desolate boulevards. Sun-bleached for sale signs line the curbs and paint peels from uninhabited buildings. A place card in the window of the Salton City Realty and Development Company declares closed Cerrado. 
Only the rattle of the wind interrupts the spe spectral quiet. Away from the lake shore, the land rises gently and then abruptly to perform the desiccated, phantasmal badlands of Anza Virgo. The Bajada beneath the badlands is open country cut by steep walled arroyos. Here, on a low, sun scorched rise dotted with cholas and indo bushes and twelve foot octo ocotillo stems, McCandless slept under the sand under a tarp hung from a creosote branch. When he needed provisions, he would hitch or walk the four miles into town, where he bought rice and filled his plastic jug at the water, mar water market liquor store, post office, and beige stucco building that serves as the cultural nexus of Greater Salton City. One Thursday in mid-January, McCandless was hitching back out to the Bajada after filling his jug when an old man, name of Ron Franz, stopped to give him a ride. Where's your camp? Franz inquired. Out past Oh My God Hot Springs, McCandless replied. I've lived in these parts six years now and I've never heard of any place that goes by that name. Show me how to get there. They drove for a few minutes down the Borrego Salton Seaway and then McCandless told him to turn left into the desert where a rough four by four track twisted down a narrow wash. After a mile or so, they arrived at a bizarre encampment where some 200 people had gathered to spend the winter living out of their vehicles. The community was beyond the fringe, a vision of post-apocalypse America. There were families sheltered in cheap tent trailers, aging hippies in day-glow vans, Charles Manson look-alike sleeping in rusted-out stud bakers that hadn't turned over since Eisenhower was in the White House. A substantial number of those present were walking around buck-naked. At the center of camp, water from the geothermal well had been piped into a pair of shallow steaming pools lined with rocks and shaded by palm trees. Oh my god, hot springs. McCandless, however, wasn't living at the springs. He was camped by himself another half mile out on the Bajada. Fans drove Alex the rest of the way, chatted with him there for a while, and then returned to town, where he lived alone, rent-free, in return for managing a ramshackle apartment building. Franz, a devout Christian, had spent most of his adult life in the army, stationed in Shanghai and Okinawa. On New Year's Eve 1957, while he was overseas, his wife and only child were killed by a drunk driver in an automobile accident. Franz's son had been due to graduate from medical school the following June. Franz started hitting the whiskey, hard. Six months later, he managed to pull himself together and quit drinking, cold turkey, but he never really got over the loss. To salve his loneliness in the years after the accident, he started unofficially adopting indigent Okinawan boys and girls, eventually taking 14 of them under his wing, paying for the oldest to attend medical school in Philadelphia and another to study medicine in Japan. When Franz met McCandless, his long dormant paternal impulses were kindled, kindled anew. He couldn't get the young man out of his mind. The boy had said his name was Alex, he declined to give a surname, and that he came from West Virginia. He was polite, friendly, well-groomed. He seemed extremely intelligent, Franz stated, in, in an exotic brogue that sounds like a blend of Scottish, Pennsylvania Dutch, and Carolina drawl. I thought he was too nice a kid to be living by that hot springs with those nudists and drunks and dope smokers. After attending church that Sunday, Franz decided to talk to Alex about how he was living. Somebody needed to convince him to get an education and a job and make something of his life. While he returned to McCandless's camp and launched into the self-improvement pitch, though McCandless cut him off abruptly. Look, Mr. Franz, he declared. You don't need to worry about me. I have a college education. I'm not destitute. I'm living like this by choice. And then, despite his initial prickliness, the young man warmed to the old-timer, and the two engaged in a long conversation. Before the day was out, they had driven into Palm, Screen, Palm Springs in Fran's truck, had a meal at a nice restaurant, and taken a ride on the tramway to the top of the San Jacinto Peak, 
at the bottom of which McCandless stopped to unearth a Mexican serape and some other possessions he'd buried for safekeepings a few years earlier. Over the next few weeks, McCandless and Fran spent a lot of time together. The younger man would regularly hitch into Salton City to do his, longer, his laundry and barbecue steaks at Fran's apartment. He confided that he was bidding his time until spring, where he intended to go to Alaska and embark on an ultimate adventure. He also turned the tables and started lecturing the grandfatherly figure about the shortcomings of a sedentary existence, urging the 80-year-old to sell most of his belongings, move out of the apartment, and live on the road. Franz took these ranges in stride and, in fact, delighted in the boy's company. An accomplished leather worker, Franz taught Alex the secrets of his craft. For his first project, McCandless produced a tooled leather belt on which he created an artful pictorial record of his wanderings. Alex was inscribed at the belt's left end, then the initials CJM for Christopher Johnson McCandless. Frame a skull and crossbones across the strip, the strip of cowhide one sees a rendering of a two-lane black top, a no-U-turn sign, a thunderstorm producing a flash flood that engulfs a car, a hitchhiker's thumb, an eagle, the Sierra Nevada, salmon convorting in the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Coast Highway from Oregon to Washington, the Rocky Mountains, Montana wheat fields, a South Dakota rattlesnake, Westerberg's house in Carthage, the Colorado River, a gale in the Gulf of California, a canoe beached beside a tent, Las Vegas, the initials TCD, Morro Bay, Astoria, and at the buckle end, finally, the letter N, presumably representing North. Executed with remarkable skill and creativity, this belt is an astonishing artifact Chris McCandless left behind. Franz grew increasingly fond of McCandless. God, he was a smart kid, the old man rasped in a barely audible voice. He directs his gaze at a patch of sand between his feet as he makes this declaration. Then he stops talking. Bending swiftly, stiffly from the waist, he wipes some imaginary dirt from his pant leg, his ancient joints cracking loudly in the awkward silence. More than a minute passes before Franz speaks again, squinting at the sky. He begins to reminisce further about the time he spent in the youngster's company. Not infrequently during their visits, Franz recalls McCallus's face would darken with anger, and he'd fulminate about his parents or politicians or the endemic idiocy of mainstream American life. Worried about alienating the boy, Franz said little during such outburst and let him rant. One day in early February, McCandless announced that he was splitting for San Diego to earn more money for his Alaska trip. You don't need to go to San Diego, Franz protested. I'll give you money if you need some. No, you don't get it. I'm going to San Diego, and I'm leaving on Monday. Okay, I'll drive you there. Don't be ridiculous, McCandless scoffed. I need to go anyway, Franz lied, to pick up some leather supplies. McCandless relented. He struck his camp stored most of his belongings in Fran's apartment. The boy didn't want to slop his sleeping bag or backpack around the city, and then rode with the old man across the mountains to the coast. It was raining when Franz dropped McCandless at the San Diego waterfront. It was a very hard thing for me to do, Franz says. I was sad to be leaving him. On February 19th, McCandless called Franz, collect, to wish him a happy 81st birthday. McCandless remembered the date because his own birthday had been seven, seven days earlier. He had turned 24 on February 12th. During this phone call, he also confessed, confessed to Franz that he was having trouble finding work. On February 28th, he mailed a postcard to Jan Burris. Hello. It reads, Have you been living on, have been living on streets of San Diego for the past week? First day I got here, it rained like hell. The missions here suck, and I'm getting preached to death. Not much happening in terms of jobs, so I'm heading north tomorrow. I decided to head for Alaska no later than May 1st, but I've got a little raise to. But I've got to raise a little cash to outfit myself. 
May go back and work for a friend I have in South Dakota if he can use me. Don't know where I'm headed now, but I'll write when I get there. Hope all is well with you. Take care, Alex.